Hi, everyone. This is Victoria English, head coach at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. Thanks for joining me today. You are in for a real treat. I'm interviewing Bradley Herodine from South Australia. Brad just finished up his 90 days with us, and he's moving into our graduate program, Beyond 90. As a Project 90 graduate, Brad has undergone a tremendous transformation. Uh, if you see this video, you'll see he's he's a uh, tough looking guy, typical Aussie, and has a wonderful personality and is a big sweetheart. He got really, really honest during his program with us, very vulnerable. Um, and again, when you see him, you, you'll find it hard to believe. But toward the end of his 90 days, he was reading us poetry from Rumi. That's what a teddy bear he is. So we're all big fans of Brad, and he's generous enough to share some of his experiences and his transformation with you today. So, Brad, thanks for being here. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So when I say big, tough guy, um, your your background kind of backs that up a little bit maybe more than a little bit. Uh, you yeah. certainly, certainly attended some schools of the hard knocks, had some consequences, overcame a lot of things. Um, can you share a little bit about how you ended up where you are with us today? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I grew up in a, a northern um, suburb of Adelaide, uh, Gawler, um some people might know it some people might not but it was sort of the um lower demographic area of a um of, of adelaide uh and um as i grew up i sort of um was involved with um uh, martial arts and uh just sort of to, to, to protect yourself and look after yourself it was sort of just part of the family tradition and um uh as i went through that uh Obviously, um, I sort of went off uh, track a bit and um, lost my way, and um, ended up uh, ended up partaking in in probably other substances that weren't so good for me, and uh, got me in a lot of trouble um, uh, up to probably the age of about eighteen, uh, and then finally sort of hit my rock bottom I would believe at, at that stage and um, decided it was time to uh, probably find a better life before it uh, ended badly you know and um, and that's what I did I sort of from there I, I, I started training and um, uh, trying to give back to the community at probably about the age of 21 I was also um, um, an apprentice chef at that at, at that point um, and that's where I sort of started my journey back uh, to, to health and happiness. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, for our listeners, there, there are parts of Brad's story that I think are going to resonate with you and perhaps resonate with some of the listeners in particular. Uh, Brad got involved in some, some unfortunate things at a very young age, as he just shared. He had some tough consequences and made a resolution to change, which I think is very admirable at that young age, especially uh, that age where we might think that we're invincible despite uh, some of the consequences that we're facing. And so you mentioned before we started recording that alcohol was, was always a factor. It was always around but it wasn't the big ugly thing that got you in trouble. And so I have a question, uh, you know, when you, when you hear about addiction and things like that, it's usually framed as drugs and alcohol. Uh, I use the term, I just say drugs because they are all drugs, but I'm curious about what it was like when you decided to give up the so-called heavy drugs, change your life, give back to the community, get involved in the martial arts, start your chef, your career as a chef. 
did you view alcohol as something safer, harmless? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, I will say, Victoria, that uh, deep down, I, I knew it wasn't um, good for me. But I guess I never had the information or as, as we're socially conditioned that it is okay to have it and it is okay to drink it. So through that whole career in martial arts, it's um, I, like I mentioned to you uh, before this, um, I did feel like I was hiding in the shadows with it, but I didn't know why I felt bad about it because everyone says it's okay. So I knew it wasn't. Um, as, as I said to you, I, I, taught kids in martial arts and uh, taught adults. I was, a, I was a leader in the community um, and I felt like I was hiding in the shadows, drinking on the weekends and uh, felt like um, uh, it wasn't the right thing to do, you know. So, um, but I didn't know why. I did not know why uh, mm. until I've um, sort of come to meet you guys now. Mm. I think that... I think that's a, a great point. And if you're listening to this and that sounds familiar, pay attention to it. Alcohol is what I describe, what I call a socially expected drug, meaning it's not just accepted, it is expected. Australians, typically uh, your culture drinks even more than us Americans. So I know that it is quite quite prevalent uh, in Australia. And yet you, you hit it for a reason. As I've come to know you, you are a, quite a, a very, very deep and, and quite sensitive man. Uh, so knowing what you know now, why do you think you hit it? I hit it um, because I felt like, well, I hit it because I felt like I was doing the wrong thing but didn't know why because mm -hmm. um, it is socially accepted. Uh, you know, you just end up sort of... Um, Drinking to mask, drinking to um, be social, uh, drinking because it's, you know, apparently uh, you know, supposedly done to create la relationships and um, you know, so you feel, you feel just about um, isolated if, if, if you're not doing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because but it I'm... never felt right for me. Never felt right for me. I always didn't want to drink, but I never knew how not to. Mm. Well said. Yes, because I'm guessing in that in that community of of athletes working with adults and working with children, somebody in there had a drink and it wasn't a big deal. So there was something inside of you saying, mm -mm, Brad, this isn't right for you. I always knew I'd be a better person without it. I just didn't know how to go about it. And I never wanted it there, but it was always there. Um, and I just didn't know why. Mm. Now that, I, I'm going to guess, resonates with every single person listening. I thought I'd be a better person without it. I just didn't know how to not drink. Hmm. We'll touch on that again in a moment. Uh, you also mentioned that, well, before I go there, during that time when you were, when you had given up the, 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 the street drugs, I'll call them the other things. Um, mm. And you were drinking, but keeping it, in the shadows and you told yourself it's because you were teaching children and you were an athlete. Was it a big problem? Did you 
get very, very drunk? Did you misbehave? Did you get into trouble when you would drink? No. No, I didn't. During that, during those years after the street ones, you mean? After the street drugs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. No, I, I was never in trouble. I was never a drink driver. I was never, um, you know, out of control. Um, no, no, I wasn't. No. It was... Uh -huh. uh, just a slow creeping um sort of drug i suppose you could say yeah mm. Mm. and therein therein lies the cognitive dissonance right mm. inside you know brad this isn't good for you this isn't something you should be doing you'd be a better person without it but the other side of the coin is i'm fine Look at that. Look at that guy over there, how messy he gets. Look at that guy, you know, mm. ending up in bar fights and this and that. So I can see where that inner conflict would have, mm. would have shown itself. And um, uh, as every Australian, and I suppose in America as well, that, you know, it's just socially done. Like if you're going out with friends, you have a drink. If you're going to out for dinner, you have a drink. If you're going anywhere, um, you have a drink. And if you're not, people sort of look at you weird. Um, you know, there was an old saying uh, that people used to say, uh, never trust never trust a bloke that doesn't drink. You know, that was one of the old sayings in Australia. Um, and it's just that social conditioning around it is just insane. So yeah, you, you're really out the gates behind you know and you what you know what chance have you got if you haven't got the right information um mm -hmm. to be able to overcome these feelings that i had you know in the past it's it's impossible with all the social conditioning and social acceptance around alcohol it's enough to tell that that knowing inner voice to to be quiet to shush 100 oh, percent. right yes, shush yeah, shush, yeah. I'm fine. What are you talking about? Leave me alone. Yeah. Let me drink in yeah. peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we'll talk about that inner voice again. So you mentioned that as you continued in your athletic pursuits, which I'm going to let you, um, well, you're not one to do this, but I'm going to invite you to brag a bit. Tell us a little bit about some of your athletic wins and accomplishments um yeah so i was a um first degree black belt in um tongue sudo or mudaquan uh, i did the practice that for about 15 16 years um i'd won quite a few australian championships i've also well uh cleaned up and got a lot of gold medals and uh, then uh, the biggest one was probably the international championships, which was over your neck of the woods in Atlanta, uh, where I uh, took out the whole thing and uh, four gold, one silver within um, sparring, weaponry, uh, breaking, um, that sort of thing. Uh, after that, I went to I went to uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, where I competed a lot in Australia. Never went international with that, but um, once again, one. Uh, a lot of competitions there and um, uh, had quite a successful um, uh, career in that also. And I was actually training for a um, uh, MMA competition when I, um, that's when I sort of, I was 40 at that stage or 39. And, uh, you know, I, I started to get quite a few injuries um, and, and sort of that's where my career ended. But I uh, had quite a few accolades uh, up to that point. Mm. And like many athletes, you suffered some, I talked about the school of hard knocks, you suffered some hard knocks and had some injuries. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so bulging discs, um, uh, you know, uh, knees, um, I've broken my ankles a couple of times, um, yeah, quite a few. Mm. Quite a few injuries that comes with uh, comes with the territory. Mm. Comes with the territory, yes. I'm just, 
I'm having a coaching moment as you just minimized <laughs> all of those, all of those injuries, Brad, that's a lot. That's a mm. lot. And yes, it comes with the ter territory, but also ouch. Um, you and I talked about this. I have no medals to show for all of my physical injuries, but I've had four ACL reconstructions. And so you and I have this in common that we, um, Hey, alcohol is an anesthetic. I used to drink over my knee pain. It was, it was quite painful every day. And that is exhausting and hard to, to hard to mm -hmm. live with. So even though we both knew that it was bad for us, it's not something we should be using as a pain medication. We both did it. Sure I did. Um, yeah, I, um, like I say, once, once I hit that 39, 39, 40, uh, years old and I had the, probably the first biggest one was, um, you know, the broken angles and that year you sort of mend and heal, but the bulging discs in my back was um, debilitating. You know, I'd had back soreness before, but you just keep pushing through. And in that um, genre, um, yeah, you just push through, you take some Voltaren, take some painkillers and uh, off you go, you go train again. But um, the bulging disc just dis uh, de debilitated me and uh, was a massive turning point in my life where I was starting to go, wait a minute, I can't do what I used to do. I can't do a spinning back kick or I can't do a a, 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 a flying, you know, I, I can't do this stuff anymore because my body won't let me. And it just uh, emotionally killed me. Um, uh, and that's when I sort of started drinking sort of heavily again, you know, at the age of probably 40. Um, uh, and definitely to mask pain for one, uh, uh, but also emotionally to 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 because it, it just killed me. I didn't know what else to do because my whole life had revolved around that. I think that's a key <laughs> point. A key point. What you just said, you were using it to to numb the physical pain, and certainly any time that we are misusing this substance, there's certainly emotional pain that we're still that we're that we're dealing with as well but your primary use was to alleviate temporarily this chronic pain and the pain that you couldn't mm. just push through anymore and then you used those two words emotional pain right so it sounds like when you realized your body was was in revolt, it was saying no more, we're not doing these things that, that impacted you tremendously, your identity, a stress release. And isn't that what alcohol loves? It just loves that little opening that it can move into and kind of prey upon our vulnerabilities. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what it did. Um, I went from sort of casual drinking um, to uh, I, I ended up having a knee operation as well, which I had five months off um, uh, from working. And uh, it, um, that's when it sort of really attacked me as well. You know, when I was bored, nothing to do, sitting around, um, I couldn't train, couldn't do anything. So, uh, you know, what did I do? I started drinking more and more beer, more, you know, and um, yeah, it was sort of, that's where it, it definitely uh, went to a new high for me anyway. The next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you're hearing this story and any of it makes sense to you, you're not alone. Um, despite my knee surgeries, I was still a runner. Then I got really, really into Bikram, the hot yoga. And it was, those those were, those were my drugs. And I would take time off from drinking and use those things instead because I, I was chasing feeling something different, something other than what was just me feeling the emotions, feeling sadness, anger, whatever was coming up. I was chasing a high and I thought, oh, I've got this solved. I've got this lit. I'll just run 
and I'll do hot yoga. Well, guess what? I popped the ACL again. And guess what moved in once I was like you. I was non-weight bearing for six or seven weeks. Ah, <sighs> and in it back it came. It was just waiting yeah. for it was waiting. Mm, it does. And Lords under the door mat to you. It gets an opening. Mm. It does. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's under the doormat. Mm. Yeah. So you just reminded me of that, that my my drinking also kind of went to a next level when I when I lost those outlets. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I think that's gonna resonate with a lot of our our athletes, um, weekend warriors, what have you. Uh, when you when you can't get that that release, that physical release, the emotional release, the endorphins, all the good things that come along with with that sort of intense exercise. Yeah. Yes. Good yeah. stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. So that was at age 40. You just turned 46. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go on, yeah, what right. was it like having an alcohol-free 46th birthday? That oh, was fantastic. I was um <laughs> what we do. Well, I was actually uh I went away with my boys. Uh we were over Ardrossan, which is a coastal town. I actually you you, you would have seen it on the polo as I took a bit I of a, a brief snap of all the cliffs and uh so uh one of my um uh, promises to myself through this journey was to go, go back to my child childhood self and have fun um and my birthday we were jetty jumping snorkeling uh with my 16 and 13 year old boys so um yeah it was it was great that was a brilliant polo yes so marco polo you guys is is an app that we use in our community it's a video app and people say, oh, I don't like being on video, but it's it's actually fantastic. And so um, along with getting to really know each other quite well and share some of our vulnerable moments, if a craving comes up and things like that, we also get to see uh, other members' backyards where they live. So we get to see Ireland and Australia. We saw the Australian beach, all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a, that was a really, really powerful post when you shared about your birthday. Yeah, it was and great. I, so I'll remember that. I'll remember that for um, the next uh, fifty years. And so will your boys. Mm. So will your boys. What a what a what a wonderful beautiful shift. And I love that you uh, have committed to becoming childlike, enjoying life like a like with the unbridled curiosity and joy of a kid. That's what I call a nice reprieve from from the realities of life. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent, and uh, uh, it's one of I mean that might resonate with some but i you know some of the best times in my life uh i liken to well when i was a kid some of the best memories are from when i was a kid when i wasn't drinking and everything was okay and um everything was um uncomplicated you know so i think taking those moments out where you can not every day you can but to uh be able to have a clear enough head and um let yourself go enough to be able to go, you know what, I'm going to be a kid today. And um, to have that ability, it's just so much fun, you know, so much fun. It is. Yeah. Yes. So if you're wondering, can I actually have fun without alcohol? Brad will tell you that you'll have a hell of a lot more fun without alcohol. And he's proof of it for sure. All right. So you had you started really drinking quite a bit at 40. Let's talk about that inner voice again. What was it doing as you, you know, lost some of these outlets, these physical outlets and and the emotional pain started to escalate as your drinking increased? Tell me a bit about that inner voice. 
Oh, the inner voice was, um, yeah, it was very, very um, confused, I would say. It was um, it was killing me over that five years that kept on masking up an old, old band-aid, you know, you, you think you're, you know, you slowly, you know, at the age of 40, I started drinking a bit more and I felt like it wasn't a problem. And then all of a sudden I go, oh, I think I might have been about 42 and I was drinking far too much. And I thought, you know what, I better uh, slow down. And then you realise, wait a minute, I can't slow down. You get off for a, a week or so and then um, you go back to it as soon as there's a stress and then you mask up another mask. So, you know, you're disappointing the kids because you said you were going to do something. And um, it was just in turn, well, my inner peace, my inner worthiness, my inner, um, you know, just just Bradley was was in turmoil, you know, that was uh, killing me slowly, physically and mentally. Mm. It goes really that way. Mm. Yes, yeah. self worth, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the, the whole time that you were drinking, you knew it wasn't the right thing to do. And there wasn't enough evidence to do anything about it. And it's so crazy that we are conditioned to believe that, it, that it has to get oh so bad before we are even given permission to consider changing our relationship with alcohol. Uh, and the drug itself demands that we use it more and more and more. Our self-worth, our self-esteem is just being bludgeoned more and more and more. And so what I've heard from you and from many members, and I've certainly said it myself, is that you do that enough times, you break enough promises to yourself, to your kids. Um, you actually do start to believe that you're that that person, a person who isn't really worth a whole lot. Can you look and, back uh, on that? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. no, no, yeah, no, you're right. I was just going to say, and, and that's so true, uh, what you say, you, you become that person or you think there's no way out. I gave up the alcohol at one stage probably six months before i came to you guys uh for probably uh four or five months you know and um white knuckling it through that um it started out okay um and and i thought oh, i got this but and then you see everyone drinking around you and you just got no information um to to bounce off to give you the tools to to be able to sort of conquer it and you just end up going back to it and I did that probably three four times over that five years and I honestly believe that you know what is that is this it for me do I got to do this for the rest of my life is there any way out or is this just who I am uh and it is uh debilitating at times and um yeah yeah I started to wonder the same thing. Is this it? I had been on and off that merry-go-round so many times. I thought, really? So this is this is my story. This is how it's going to go. Um, but human beings are amazing, right? That one little seed of hope, a little seed of self-compassion, like, okay, damn it. My story doesn't end this way. This isn't how it's going to go. Get, can give us just enough to take that first step. So yeah, yeah good on good on uh, you. Thank you, thank you. Good on you. Mm. Cheers to us, mate. And so, <laughs> what's it take for you know again, sweetheart of a man, but a but a tough guy, right? A driven guy, a guy who pushes through you've used that word a couple of times pushes through pushes through what does it take for you to finally say you know what no i'm i'm not just going to push through again i'm going to 
I'm going to reach out to this guy, James, that I keep seeing pop up. I guess um, as we, I guess as, as humans, we're always searching to be better um, and searching for answers if we're not happy in the state we're in. So I was listening to the podcast, um, obviously with uh, the ambition to give away alcohol because I knew it was it was killing me and I knew it was um, destroying my family life, everything, you know, and I just wanted off and out. And I started listening to podcasts, different podcasts about um, uh, kicking alcohol and James resonated with me and uh, uh, yourself as well. You were on there and, and Sarah uh, and, and you guys, I was listening and it just made sense and I uh, heard about this P90 uh, opportunity and um, I, I made the call and sort of the, the rest is history, you know, and it just resonated with me and uh, the talk about it and people's um, uh, experiences, uh, you know, I had to investigate it. Mm. I'm so glad you did. Mm. I know too. there's a lot of people who are glad you did. Um, so what do you think about yourself now? Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, you know, that's a continuing, um, uh, continuing uh, journey, but at the minute me from 90 days ago is, is, is phenomenal the change and like i said in the polo once again is is, is just my self-worth um you know we get the tools you've given us the tools to understand what's going on in our, in our brain and and really overcome the um hangs of alcohol and 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 going back to alcohol and understanding what's happening with the neuroscience which is fantastic but for me, what I've got back is just the worthiness and um, self-worth. You know, my kids trust me again. I can, I trust myself to rock up again. Um, I don't wake up with a hangover and go, oh, I'm not going to go to this. I'm not going to go to that. I, I, I commit to something. I commit to it with honesty and love. And, um, and I've just found meaning again, meaning in my life and excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have you have um you know the words pushing through those those are those are words that that we hear often in our community everyone in there is mm. is a high achiever driven uh intelligent focused goal oriented and by you sharing this uh it's going it's going to leave leave an impression on some of our listeners who have tried all the all the tactics that mm. provided them with with success and achievement in the past. And for some weird reason, it's just not working mm. with when it comes to alcohol. And like you said, the neuroscience, um, your brain, once it's once it's accustomed to this drug and becomes to an extent dependent on this drug, it doesn't care how much uh, how much money you've made or how many medals you've won what role you hold well, in your community it doesn't care <laughs> yeah. um and I and I guess the beauty of, of you know this program is before this I mean I was part of community of course but um, this community is just uh, you've got the freedom to open up because everyone's on the same journey and from all walks of life over the country, I mean, over the world, sorry. And uh, from, from, you know, different genres of, of corporate and um, uh, you know, me and offshore and just so many different people, but you know what, we're, we've all got the same, had the same affliction and um, uh, we're all on the same journey and there's just so much support and love and openness and honesty uh, which just just makes it so much easier as well because you've got that support network that you know you can open up to without judgment. So it's, it's just amazing. It really is. Uh, that's that's what's been big for me and and helping me open up. You know, you say big tough guy and you know what? Like, um, yeah, that, that guy had to be there for 
to to sort of get through certain parts areas of my life but um deep down I, I knew this is who I am I'm actually a nurturing caring uh person um so that's what this has taught me also it's bringing me back to who I really am you know so it's uh you know I can't thank you guys enough it's amazing oh gosh so beautifully put yes and um you're so you're you're absolutely right uh everyone that comes everyone in life but certainly the people who come into our program have have worn different masks different personas and uh it's it's a it's a relief to begin to take those take off that armor and just be yourself and come home to the real you be with the real yeah. you and um yeah. you know i mean if i were in a dark alley, I wouldn't mind walking with Brad because he does give that persona. I'm not going to be mad about it, but I love that you have opened up and been vulnerable and real with us. It's you have, um, well, just like you, you were back in your earlier days, you're a role model and a teacher for others. And that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So before we wind up, uh, Brad is staying around. He decided to continue his journey with us into Beyond 90. Beyond 90 is for our members who have completed 90 days, but once they learn the neuroscience and how we recover and heal from alcohol use disorder, uh, he understood the importance of, of one year without drinking, but more importantly, um, you know, that, wow, when, once alcohol is behind us, we really do get to take back the pen and start to write our, our new chapter. And uh, that's a big part of, of Beyond 90. So you just started in Beyond 90, but what what do you think the title of this next chapter is going to be? Uh, probably, actually, we're doing a book study at the moment, Letting Go. So uh, that's a big one for me. I'm I'm uh, just looking forward to letting go and uh, finding, uh, you know, there's no rush. Um, I feel content uh, and I'm happy with the, with, with the journey as it is now. Um, so letting go, that's, that's my next chapter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chapter 46 in the book of Brad, letting go. <laughs> Let's do it. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Brad, for being here. For, your, for our listeners, uh, be like Brad. Book that discovery call, 15 minutes. We'll just have a chat, see how and if we can help you. No matter what the outcome is, it's a huge step to reach out and uh, just connect with someone. Thank you, Brad, for connecting with me and for connecting with our listeners. It's that ripple effect thank that we talk about. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. All right. Until next time, you guys have a great day. Take good care.